<clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. And oh, I think I pressed the button too soon. I'll wait for for Richie back there. Uh, thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and to talk to everyone. Um, like the other speakers just said, I think everyone, the first panel alone took all my, my uh, main points. Um, uh, and plus, there's lunch coming up. Um, so I, don't, I, I think I'm going to, you'll just see me skip through a few of these charts. I'm going to try to do it maybe in 30 instead of 45 minutes and then leave time for a question and answer. Because I think that's, I think we've seen through the program so far, that's the most value you can get. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to uh, uh, the team that put this uh, on to the Strategic uh, Risk and IRM for inviting me to another event to speak. Um, this one <clears throat> a lot different than the first one I did that was just strictly risk management. Um, thank you for Debbie, Victoria, and Helen for all their hard work putting this together. I've put together, like, like a lot of you have conferences and you have to have a really good detail-oriented and very patient uh, staff to make that work. And then the venue, I'm just amazed. You know, in, in the United States, uh, we our engineering and technology buildings look like concrete bunkers with no windows. And this is like the Taj Mahal, the worship of engineering and technology. So for me, it's like a, a kid in a candy store. So thank you. Um, ready for the next chart, uh, Richie? Maybe I pressed the button. I think I ruined the, uh, or did I, did, I, did I push the button? No, that's the black button. Oh, we can, we can skip that chart. That, this is a, a video to play. Okay, that was a video to play uh, during a break with the Earth going by from the space station. So, I think I covered that. So, I'm going to start today talking about the science. Um, uh, why is this important? It's important because we all work in this risk management field. We're working in the ESG field. And <clears throat> what I found in my life, if you can just get some basic fundamental principles, we call it sort of first principles of what really is going on. It really helps us communicate. Um, uh, sort of jokingly, people always ask me, like, why, why did you become an engineer? You know, I do a lot of mentoring and things and, and speaking, and they said, I say, um, half jokingly, half the truth is because I couldn't read and write as a child. But once I got to a certain level of education, I could get concepts and apply those concepts. And that's all engineering is. is it, but if you really understand that concept, you can apply it to different problems. Um, also, when I worked at SpaceX, uh, people all just want to know about Elon Musk, what's Elon like, and he's such a genius, and so, so on and so forth. Or they used to be more positive, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I started working there in 2013. But um, um, I don't know if he's a genius or not, but he is so talented at taking complexity and breaking it down and communicating something in a very simple way. And uh, with analysts that would you know, be experts in guidance and navigation or thermodynamics, he would, he would uh, challenge their results. And I'm like, oh. And more times than not, he was right because he, does, he is a... Um, uh, he's a great engineer. His training, though, is in physics. He has a uh, master's in physics. There's no engineering degrees. But he just makes him a great engineer, a great systems engineer, because he's always going to the fundamental things. So I'm going to try to give you a little background, a lot of the stuff you guys know, but hopefully maybe in a different way that'll, that'll strike uh, some uh, um, chords with you guys. Um, this number keeps changing. When I first started lecturing, it was 50 million tons, but we put about uh, 160 million tons of man-made uh, global warming gases in the atmosphere every year. Um, and why is that a problem, right? And so a lot of people don't understand that. Um, here's a picture from space uh, the astronauts took. I can't tell if it's a sunrise or sunset. In space, um, the sunrise and sunsets last about two seconds. So in a blink of an eye, it's really hard to get this picture. In a blink of an eye, you go from total um, uh, um, uh, sun into total darkness. Um, so these are actually um, really hard to take. And the astronauts that are, uh, every time they go to space for the first time, consistently, without exception, they come back and, and when they talk about their experience in space, they go, I just couldn't believe how thin the atmosphere was. So if you look at the curvature of the Earth, you picture, and we, we go to school, we get those pictures of the troposphere and the stratosphere and all these kind of layers on there. That's the whole thing right there. And to, to give it um, I've got a chart on the next page to help us understand it a little bit better. So let's start with this uh, lower, oh, I've got a pointer here too. Let's start with this lower thing here. We can all walk six kilometers. If you live in London, you're probably doing that two or three times a day. 50% um, of the atmosphere is below six kilometers. That's amazing. You only have to go a little bit less than half, uh, twice that. 75%, that's where we fly in airplanes. Um, fly about 10 kilometers high. Uh, the top of the troposphere, you're only 15K. We can, everybody in this room can walk 15K. Um, that's 90% of the atmosphere. 
and we arbitrarily say space is way up there at 100, way, way up there, and that's 99.9999, that's four nines. That's pretty much almost all the atmosphere, uh, except for a few molecules up there. So the atmosphere is very finite, very thin. It's a thin atmosphere that hugs the Earth. And as Al Gore said when he opened his uh, the COP27, you know, we've been treating it like a sewer. We know not to do that with rivers. Well, it depends what country you're in. But we know not to do that with rivers. We know not to do it with lakes. The ocean, we're realizing, is finite as well. We're realizing we have the technology to be able to fish the or uh, ocean's drives. Just in Alaska, I spent the summer up there working on a fishing boat. And um, um, it, the climate change there is, is in the, the fish stocks and everything. So many things that are affecting um, their economy up there with fishing. It's, it's, it's amazing. So anyways, the atmosphere is very, very thin. It, it, it hugs the earth. It's not this infinite resource, uh, as we know other things are. Uh, just a quick couple slides on the uh, physics here. Of course, the sun hits the earth, right? Warms the earth. Most of that warmth is absorbed by uh, the earth. Uh, and the thing we have to understand here that's key is, whoops, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, the earth is 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, roughly. It's really like 78, 21. But 1% trace gases. So um, the problem is when, after the uh, earth heats up, that heat is re reflected and it comes as, uh, changes wavelength from the visible into the infrared wavelengths. And it gets trapped by these um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Most of the, ga most of the gas is, like I'm saying, 99% oxygen, nitrogen. So that doesn't trap it. That's okay. It gets, passes right through it, just like it, the, re the radiation passed into the Earth. But just that tiny percent of those trace gases is what's causing our planet to warm. And of course, this is not just scale, by the way. Um, if we look at the f uh, f four rocky planets near the Earth, Mercury's going to show up in a minute. Um, you look at the different atmospheres, Mars, close to no atmosphere, it's about 1% the density of um, uh, the Earth. The Earth, it's, this is like my Goldilocks chart, this has just the perfect amount of greenhouse gases that keep it warm, just warm enough but not too warm. And of course Venus is 96% carbon dioxide and that is a runaway um, global warming looks like. And if you can look here at the next chart here. Um, you see the temperatures, and even though um, Mercury is closer to the sun, you see how Venus is three times the, um, the temperature. That's because, of course, these greenhouse gases. So we want to have greenhouse gases, otherwise we wouldn't have terrestrial life. That, along with the magnetosphere, allows us to have terrestrial life, and we, life crawled out of the ocean. <clears throat> so we have this protective greenhouse gases, which is great. Um, so back to science, we know exactly uh, what kind of gases there are in the atmosphere. We know where they come from, what sectors of the economy. We know even what countries. Um, I heard from COP27 uh, uh, there was a nonprofit being started to really take even more detailed look and actually pinpoint how much carbon is coming from individual sources, individual carbon, um, um, coal plants and natural gas plants. <clears throat> Another thing to understand global warming is all of this heat is really being trapped in the ocean. This is what we call a heat sink. So if you take a gas a stove, you put a, a cast iron frying pan on it, right? It takes a while for that to heat up, but right? the flame goes on and off, but the pan takes a while, you cook your food, take your food off, the pan takes a long time to go down. So this <clears throat> heat is all being trapped in the ocean, and that has yet to uh, affect the, the uh, um, climate, and it's slowly, slowly going to, it's building up and building up, and as we see, it's getting, um, causing havoc across the planet. Um, uh, back to the science, um, especially in America, it's very sensitive to talk about um, global warming, but we have over a thousand satellites um, uh, around the Earth that are looking at, um, at um, climate change in some way. Most of these are Earth observation satellites. Uh, we, look, we have a lot, 100 um, space science and observations, 20 on Earth science. And so we're looking not just to, at the weather, we're looking at the oceans, the sea level, the salinity, uh, chlorophyll, ice, snow melt, everything, and many different layers of the atmosphere. Uh, so I was fortunate to uh, participate in launching some of these satellites, either on the space shuttle or the Falcon 9 when I worked at um, SpaceX. And people always think, have different ideas of what NASA is, but NASA is actually um, a world leader in climate studies 
and earth science, and we have been for decades, and our job is to produce robust scientific data needed to understand climate change. We're, unfortunately, we're not decision makers or policy makers, but we share this information with the whole world and for free, and hopefully that'll influence um, decision makers. Uh, so this, you might recognize this similar chart from uh, my cover sheet. This is a visualization of all the atmospheric um, currents and the jet stream around the planet. So I'll get into this a little bit, and then we'll get to some other topics. But to understand <clears throat> uh, uh, climate change, you have to start to understand, um, you know, when the radiation from the sun hits the planet, right, it's going to obviously... The, the tropics and the equator, we're, we're ignoring simplified problem here. We're ignoring the tilt of the uh, axis. We're ignoring the Coriolis effect of the atmosphere. But just a basic thermodynamics and the thermodynamic laws, it's going to be hotter at the equators than the poles, right? Easy to understand. So that um, naturally, the, the temperature is going to want to even itself. Uh, everything wants to go in equilibrium. Just like if you're in the cold winter, and you've got your nice heated car and you open the door, what's going to happen? It's going to try to equalize, right? That heat's going to disperse and, and right outside the door. Or vice versa, if you're in the summer and you've got your nice air-conditioned car and you open the door and your spouse is like, close the door, close the door, I'm going to melt. So, um, um, so these things are always trying to equalize, and that's what causes the atmospheric currents and everything, and along, again, with the Coriolis effect. But a simple... A simple scale, that's what's going on, right? Everything wants to be in equilibrium in physics, right? In entropy and all these um, uh, physical theories. So one um, degree increase in temperature at the equator ends up being three times uh, the increase at the poles. And that makes sense because the, the temperature gradient is so high, it's trying to equalize um, there. Um, Next topic I want to hear, a lot of people talk about the polar vortex. Like, why do I care about the polar vortex, you know? Well, what, what is the polar vortex uh, to start out with? So it's a low-pressure system. Think of it as a big sort of hurricane or cyclone that goes around both poles in a circle. Um, it's very, very high up there. It's 15 to 50 kilometers. That's way up in the stratosphere. And it just trucks around in a circle. And in the winter, it's cold and quite uh, strong. And in the summer it gets weak and it starts getting these wiggles going up and down and up and down. Um, and that's natural. That's, that's how we get weather. This is what drives weather. This is um, what should be happening. So the, the polar vortex way up here at the top of the stratosphere push if greatly, it, not greatly, it drives the jet stream, which are down here, in the, down here closer to Earth. So the, um, uh, the jet streams are way down at 18 to 14 kilometers. So as you get more uh, uh, heat trapped in the atmosphere, you get more and more wiggles and more and more um, um, uh, unpredictable wiggles. So this is actually a natural thing, but when you get too much, crazy things happen like the polar vortex splitting into two and three, and I'll show some pictures of those, what those look like. Um, so this is the polar vortex from 2018, uh, a um, animation of how that split. Uh, in, in half, and it brings freezing cold weather way down. If you remember, it froze in Texas for like a week and a half. I lived there for about 30 years, and that has never happened yet. And Europe has been experiencing some of that. Here's in um, January 3rd, 2019, it actually split into three, the polar vortex, and that caused hammock with the jet streams and everything. And here's the jet stream splitting up into chaos here. So the reason this is important to understand is it drives, again, this is what drives our weather across the whole planet. Um, and one of these times when the polar vortex split, we had temperatures of 28 Celsius at the North Pole in February. This is the middle of winter. So just unprecedented kind of things going on. And that's what bring these waves and big squiggles is what brings huge uh, snow storms to Italy, ice storms to Dublin, the huge uh, heat waves you've been having in England and all over Northern Europe. Um, and crazy things like we've seen, you know, roads melting, the bitumen, we call it asphalt in America, weren't designed for these temperatures, right? And then um, you see these crazy pictures, and this is what happens if you drive over a melted uh, bitumen road. This is from Australia. And then even airports here in London, here we are at this high latitude of 50-some degrees, um, had to be closed because the, air, the runway was melting. You couldn't land planes. So we've talked about it this morning, too. The infrastructure that we have is not designed and as an engineer. We have de engineers do not design our structures and infrastructures for the, 
the warming planet that we have. And I don't want to make a whole presentation about death and destruction pictures, but I think Pakistan is worth mentioning. It really got the attention of uh, climatologists and everyone around the world just because it's, to say it was a uh, catastrophe of biblical proportion would not be an overstatement. Um, uh, they normally have droughts and monsoons, but this monsoon was over five times the rainfall, imagine, th which put the, a third of the country underwater. Thousands of people died. Millions of uh, homes were either damaged or destroyed. Bridges, roads, livestock. And the reason that's so, um, we've mentioned it here before, too, um, th this morning, you know, 40% of the population work in agriculture. So it's not just like, oh, I have a materialistic loss. No, you've lost your uh, way to make uh, money and, and recover into the future. That's why Pakistan's asking for so much international aid, because how do you recover when you've lost that much livestock, when you've lost that many crops? You can't just go back to work after the water, the floods subside, and, and just start back where you left off. Um, and these are NASA images, uh, satellite images, um, of Pakistan in this in the center with and these are not natural color these are enhanced color but you can tell by that's the before this is August 4th the, the floods were on the 20th and then the satellite came whipping around that part of the earth again and took a similar picture just uh, unbelievable but just things you can see with your own naked eye um, what's what's even worse is this was on the heels of uh, deadly heat waves the year before and uh, or the summer the, the same summer where they already had, Pakistan was already having um, uh, wildfires, uh, glacial uh, outbursts, and that's what this picture is here in the lower right of when the, um, <clears throat> when the glaciers melt, they, they overflow their lakes and just come barreling down, and um, there's this horrible um, uh, damage, and people actually died on this bridge when it collapsed, just being thrown out. Um, so, um, and then the monster monsoon came shortly after that. So. You know, one of the most vulnerable places on Earth. Um, to summarize, hopefully I've tried to give you some visualizations and some pictures in your mind on, on what, how this all works. We have heat that's trapped by the way it's ra radiated and gets trapped by the uh, greenhouse gases. Why, why, what's happening is heat, well, it's trying to equalize, right? And there's so much heat, it's equalizing in ways we haven't seen and making these waves and squiggles go around. Um, it's disturbing the... The, on a good day, the, the, or for a millennium, the polar vortex and the jet stream drive weather, but now with the extra heat, it's driving us into uh, uncharted territory with even more instability than normal, a normal summer. So I had a um, mnemonic for you. I think I'm going to skip it in the of time. Just, just out of curiosity, does anybody know who Louis Thoreau is in that song, Jiggle Jiggle? Oh, it went crazy. It went crazy. Uh, uh, in America, and I, I looked up in the internet, I couldn't find any reference to it here. It sounds like it's a, a U.S. thing, but so I, I, I'll, I think I'll skip this, but I came up with my own original world um, about the wiggles of the atmosphere, so I'll, I'll let you read that a little bit. But um, uh, and we talk about, we talked about politics, we talked about who the U.S. presidents are, and regardless if what color of uh, the presidents, you know, red party, green party, excuse me, we don't have a green party in America, red party, blue party, <laughs> Democrats, Republicans, the DOD has seen climate change as a risk for decades, and they've been working on biofuels, and you talked about um, well, how, do, how do you plug your tank in? Well, but you could run your tank on biofuels that could be renewable, and they've been looking at that, but they, um, uh, they look at this uh, for what it is, which is a sort of existential threat, not just to America, but to all of uh, civilization. So, that, you know, they, they've said for years before things were happening long before 2014 and the climate change and long after. But, you know, they talk about water shortages, pandemics, which we've just been through one, uh, refugee crises, resources, uh, and disasters, what we're seeing more and more every year. Um, I'll skip through a lot of these. Uh, I think you guys are such a savvy audience. We know that climate change is going to drastically affect our food supply, our water. We know where food grows in the world, who has a food surplus, who has a food shortage. Um, and, you know, food is... Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> These are for sale on my website. No, no. 
<laughs> these are for free. I've I, I've told Debbie. Yeah, <laughs> no, actually, I, don't, these, I told Debbie. I'm, I'm, all these, um, I'm all these. I'm sharing all these slides with whoever wants them. So, because um, most of them were not created by me. Some were by the uh, Climate Reality Project and other and NASA and you know all these things. So you know, food obviously is complex. I'm not going to go into all this, but the big drivers: drought, heat, fires, right? Which we're seeing more of. Pests, we're seeing more of. Floods um, affect our food supply. Um, Water, we have reduced supply uh, happening in parallel with increased demand, and you can already see um, uh, wars over fresh water, and you see sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the civil wars are over water after droughts. And of course, as temperature rise, so does the demand for the water use. Um, it already affects about 40% of our population. Um, in health, I don't want to go into a lot of details here, uh, health is very complex, but obviously it's driven by how much water you have, how much food you have, disease, air pollution, uh, all this stuff. So climate change is a medical emergency is, is one quote. Another one that's pretty powerful is climate change is the biggest global health threat in the 21st century. So there's so many facets to this, and I think most of you in the, this room are well aware of that. So I sort of want to slow down a little bit. You know, it's paralyzing all these. Every, every time I do research and and go to the conferences and stuff in in um where's the woman that went to the cop 27 um uh, it, but you know it's just it's amazing that you know uh it's, it's overwhelming this information that we have we have so much data and you know but how do we turn it we're risk managers we need to just like an engineer right engineers are flooded with test data and satellite data and telemetry and we have to figure out how to make data into information. And then as risk managers, we have to take information and make it actionable for our clients, for ourselves, for our governments. Um, and so that's, that's the, that's the uh, hard part, right? As we talked about this morning, and all, every, everybody here talked about the science, the economics, the society, political and moral and ethical questions, um, which climate change is forcing us into. And, and where I want to point out here that's so important is even if we stop become carbon neutral today, the planet, because of the oceans, that heat sink, the, um, the planet is going to continue to warm. So we're, it's already baked into our planet. Our future has already been told. So people talk a, a lot this morning about the one and a half degrees. Um, even if we stop polluting today or stop putting greenhouse gases in, we're going to be well, in my opinion, well above that. And the problem is that the carbon dioxide can linger in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Uh, I met a gentleman that wrote a book that said we won't get back to pre-industrial um, CO2 levels until maybe 100,000 years for the rock and the oceans to reabsorb that. So we've, we've sort of, the, the way I like to say it is we're fully committed to living in a, a lot higher atmosphere. And it's just a fact. Um, there, even if, there, you know, we talked about sar carbon uh, sequestration, that certainly would help. Everything would help. And like the gentleman said, we should continue to work uh, extremely hard on reducing our greenhouse gases because uh, it will make our futures even that much worse. But the, the truth is, besides the uh, COVID year, CO2 continues to go up year after year. It's going to go up again by the time we finish estimating 2022. Now, maybe we're slowing that growth, but we're still going up. So I, I see no way that humans are going to... Um, uh, stop that in any, in any short term, any, in the last next 50 or 100 years. Um, so as risk managers, you know, we deal with uncertainty and we deal with risks. Um, we know what's going to happen. We're just not sure when exactly it's going to happen and how it might affect your exact location on the planet. But we, we've had the science for decades um, on what's, what's going to happen. And what's at stake? So what's, you know, it's not going to be the end of the human species. It's not going to be the end of the planet Earth. It's about the biosphere. It's all these little organisms and plants and species living on the surface of this rocky, uh, wet planet. You know, and it's not about even preserving normalcy. There won't be any normalcy, if me and you know. It's about saving civilization, our way of life. We want to avoid uh, um, food and water shortages, uh, disease and war. And one of the points I like to make is that um, civilization is so fragile. The pandemic exposed that, right? I've also lived through three financial crises uh, in my, my short time here on the planet. 
and it's just amazing how, like, a, we called it the uh, subprime crisis, which was just a sneeze in America. It rippled across the whole globe, erased trillions of dollars of um, <clears throat> wealth, and that shouldn't, have, that shouldn't have happened, but it shows how fragile our financial systems and our civilization it, uh, is. Um, you know, and we, we do our best, but, you know, it's not a smooth line, right? As history has taught us, civilization does not just go in one direction. And this is why I want to sort of put this into perspective. I was like, I'm a sort of big picture guy. I like to talk about the big picture. Um, so if you just think about the Earth, four and a half billion years old, we've only been around for 200,000 years, at least anybody that you might recognize. Um, and these are quite early, handsome humans here. Um, uh, you know, civilization, people, we're so vain as humans, civilization's only been around for 6,000 years. So people go, oh, well, this rock over here, this shows that it's 12,000, okay, 12,000 years, whatever you want to say. We just um, learned how to uh, domesticate animals and agriculture and uh, form governments and things like that. The Industrial Revolution, for God's sake, was only 300 years ago. We screwed this place up in 300 years. <laughs> I, and... Uh, Carl Sagan's made this made this uh, uh, cosmic calendar popular, and I won't uh, I won't go into this. But th this is uh, if the Earth is four and a half billion years old, you know, uh, and this is a 365 day calendar. You know, humans showed up at, at 11:59 on December 31st, and with 15 seconds to go, you know, started you know learning how to have written language and culture and dance and. And then suddenly, in a, in a blink of an eye, threw all this carbon in the air. Um, and people always say, well, we, the Earth had higher levels of CO2 than this, and they're absolutely right. But it's been pretty stable for the last million years. Humans didn't even exist till here, and then boom, the Industrial Revolution hit. So we have to keep this in perspective. It's not about the species of the planet. This is about uh, civilization. And what does history tell us? Um, history tells us that... Um, you know, the climate's been stable for 12,000 years, and this has allowed us to do these things like writing and poetry and dance and uh, uh, jiggle jiggle songs from, from Louis Thoreau. Um, and NASA observations, along with archaeologists and climate change specials, have sort of discovered some lessons from the past. Uh, so here's, uh, actually I was just in Morocco, which is nowhere near Oman, but it was, Morocco does have a lot of deserts. Um, so there, there was a rumor or a legend of the lost city of Ubar. And it was, uh, it was actually in the 80s, uh, the last space shuttle uh, mission of the Challenger, the doomed Challenger um, space shuttle. Um, they took some special radar equipment up there. And working with uh, archaeologists and other people, they actually found the lost city of Ubar. So when we found out exactly what happened to this poor city of Ubar, it's now in Oman. Um, as you would expect, if you're in the desert and you're a nomad and you find water, you're going to stay there. So they uh, formed the city right over this nice aquifer. And unfortunately, it was a, li a limestone aquifer. So after the hundreds of years of drawing the water out there, the whole city collapsed into a giant sinkhole uh, about 3000 BC. And you can go there and visit it. And you can actually found it on Google Maps. You can just say Ubar, and it comes up. And you'll see the big holes there. Um, the Egyptian uh, um, civilization, the old kingdom, Egypt had three different kingdoms. So this is the very first Egyptian kingdom that, that built the pyramids and the sphinx. Uh, that ended uh, uh, at 2130 BC, about 4,000 years ago, from a, a mega drought. Um, the Mayans, they ended about 900 AD before Europeans came over there. Uh, from a drought and from over usage. And this one is a lot, this one sort of rings even closer to today's um, society. Angkor, in a uh, very exact date, 8, 1431, had severe droughts followed by intense flooding. And you can just, these words are like true today for so many cities and things that have happened. The city's water management couldn't cope with the intense flooding. Its infrastructure suffered intense damage. Um, sounds familiar, like not just Pakistan, but all over America. So. We have, history tells us what's going to happen uh, if we ignore the environment. Um, uh, so where does this leave us, right? And, and my uh, theme for today is we must adopt. We don't really have a choice. There's no going back. There's no going back to the normalcy of our childhood or our f uh, prior generations. You know, where are we going to live? Where are we going to grow food? Where do we locate our business? And that's, I think the hard part is 
what part of civilizations do we want to save? You know, I mean, they're putting all the dams up around Venice, trying to save Venice and those kind of things. But can we really save Miami Beach? Can we really save New York? I don't know. And what does it cost? Um, the Biden administration is actually trying to quantify it, which is nice. They have a lot of things yet to quantify. But as we've talked this morning, two people are trying to figure out um, how much is this is going to cost. And these are just sort of wild numbers, like you've said, like everybody said this morning. We have no idea, but we think um, it could cost us. 23 billion by 2050, Oxford says it could go into green energy, could save the world 12 trillion by 2050. It's really hard to say. I heard from COP27, four and a half trillion per year to transition. So we really don't know, but we do know we have to adopt. Um, I'll skip these charts. These are just how much it would cost per city in some of the big cities. So I have a proposal for us. I'm almost on time. Um, I say as, as a risk community, we should let's mitigate these risks, right? Let's start figuring out how we're going to adapt to this planet, right? Let's use our paradigm. What can go wrong? How likely is it? What are the associated consequences? And I think uh, we know all these things. I think we should try to save civilization. I'd like my iPhone. Um, I like watching Netflix. Um, I listen to the BBC. Um, and there's got a lot of good things, right? We know what these risks are. I won't read these, but. We all, I think in this room, is pretty savvy. We know, we know what the risks are. And I think we should stop doing the research. Not stop. We should de-emphasize the research, de-emphasize all these risk assessments, and start actually doing the risk management. And the risk management is the step where you actually have to take action, right? It's where we actually say, what should I do today? What, and what do you recommend to your clients? And maybe what you do in your family, in your backyard. Maybe you learn how to plant food. We don't know. Um, and risk management is always about uncertainty, right? If there wasn't uncertainty in a problem, <clears throat> you wouldn't have risk managers because we knew something was going to happen. You wouldn't have to hire a risk manager or do risk management if we knew it wasn't going to happen, right? So we just don't know when things are going to happen and exactly how they're going to unfold. We know at a macro level, and we have for decades, what's going on. So, you know, we think we know what to do, but... You know, and some people are like, hey, you know, as a species, we've been through two ice ages, and we can, we can do this. But those were cooling planets. We've never really adapted to a warming planet, right? And they talk about the loss of species. Hopefully the humans won't be one of those. Um, but today, you know, the bright side, we have so much more tools, so much data, so much science, so much technology. It's going to really be a test um, uh, uh, for the human species. And as we said this morning, too, I'm, again, reiterating everyone's points. Um, do we have the collective will? So I've had some great po photos here. I live in Washington State now the last three years. You know, should we just keep playing golf? You know, you know, as the world burns. Well, this is a real photograph, by the way. Uh, here's another one, you know, in, in Colorado. Uh, and I'm guilty of this, too. I was in uh, um, Canada. I did a mountain bike ride, and I saw this big billow of smoke a couple miles away. I'm like, well, I'm not, not, not on my trail right now, so keep going. Um, and, then, and then, you know, this is one of my favorite ones from uh, York. You know, and she's cleaning the windows, waiting for the customers to come in. You know, with a, I don't know why these, what these windows must be made out of, like, you know, two-inch glass or something. You know, so uh, I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, derogatory towards the British culture, but and maybe it's time we don't just keep calm and carry on, you know. This is the time for action, not for keeping calm and carrying on, you know. Uh, and we've touched on this. Again, you guys almost stole my points. You know, 20% of the world is democracies, but are they functional democracies? 70% uh, is authoritarian. I guess 10%, we don't know what they are. Um, <laughs> and and then, then, thank God, this last week we had our midterm elections, and it looks like the U.S. for at least two more years will stay in this general vicinity. <laughs> But, but somebody already said the next election and mentioned uh, Ron DeSanto. So we'll see. We'll see if we become the way of North Korea. Um, and then in America, it's, I don't know what it's like in Europe, but you know, we can't even talk about it. I can't talk about climate change with my coworkers or my family. It's just too, it's like, oh, you're one of those. You're a liberal. You're a blah, blah, blah. And I go, no, I'm an engineer. I believe in science. And science is agnostic to whether you care about science or whether you believe in science, right? And so this is really embarrassing. Um, 40 uh, the 50 states in middle school, that's 10 years old to 13 years old, um, 
uh, have like barely a mention of climate change, like one little sentence in a, in a thing because it's all controlled by local uh, uh, school board members. And Florida is, is not allowed to include it at all in their uh, curriculum. And so teachers are sort of sitting there like, what am I supposed to do now? You know? So those are the most formal ages of children, right? From those ages when you're dealing with your identity, and what, you, what you're good at, what you're bad at, what you like, what you don't like. Um, so the mitigations, um, I always use this analogy today, uh, wasn't that presentation, but we live on this thing called the space, uh, spaceship Earth. It's hurling around the sun at thousands of kilometers per hour, tens of thousands, and then it's hurling around the center of the Milky Way galaxy um, at hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour. So there's really no place to go. People literally, many, many times, um, oh, you work at SpaceX? Oh, I'm so glad Elon's going to Mars. You know, Elon wants a million people living on Mars. Well, um, this is not really a good mitigation for climate change. Um, Mars has no atmosphere. Most importantly, it has no magnetosphere, so the cosmic radiation would kill any terrestrial life. So if you watch some of the um, National Geographic specials on Mars, they're living in lava tubes underground, and God knows where you're getting the water. There is water on Mars, but it's locked into the soil. So it would take, you know, nuclear power plants there to rip all this moisture out of the soil. Um, so this is not a good backup plan for just continuing the um, uh, civilization in the, in, the, in the course that we're taking now. Uh, we, need, we need to build resilient cities. Um, I used to work at NASA for this guy. You might recognize him from uh, Apollo 13, who's played by, um, I forgot the actor's name now, if you want to help me out. Um, and my other favorite movie, The Martian, uh, when I worked at SpaceX, we were so excited about that. Elon rented like 12 theaters. We all got free showing of The Martian. This was written by, uh, it was free. It was a, it was a J NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. NASA engineer wrote this stuff for free, just put it on PDFs and gave it away for free on the Internet. And then it became such a phenomenon. They, he published a book and made a movie. And he's really an introvert. He hates going to conferences and, and uh, talking. And my friend had dinner with him. And he sat there and going, I hate this. What time do I kind of leave? You know? But he accidentally did this great book. And, but what I like both these movies about is it shows you how you solve problems, right? You break it down. It's, look, climate change is uncomprehensible to the human mind, all the facets of it. But just take one bite at a time, break into teams, solve one problem at a time, and move on to the next. So the fictitious, fictitious character, Mark Watney, said, you know, at some point, everything is going to go south. You can either accept it or you can get to work. So... Um, you know, one of our largest challenges, right, I talked about um, the willpower, right? Um, we need leadership, but we also need me and you and everyone else on board on this. And you can lead through grassroots, you can lead locally, you can lead at your city council. Uh, we don't have to be the president of our countries to lead. Um, and we have to use specific data to our locations. We have this data now. We know uh, just about what's going on in every part of the world. I like to say that, you know, Venice is not Vancouver, is not uh, Vanuatu, which is a small Pacific country in the West. Think globally, act locally comes to mind. Um, you know, what's going on in your client, in your town, your business, your home, your home, your island, your community, your family. <clears throat> so, in summary, um, we need all hands on deck to address climate change. It's such a complex, multifaceted risk. It can be overwhelming. We need to sort of be that change we want to see in the world. Voting's important, especially in America, where 26% of the people vote, and that's a huge turnout. Uh, we need to model behaviors. And everything we know and love is, is at stake for this. Um, there, you know, good news. We're sort of waiting to see what's going to happen. Uh, like we said, out of COP27, maybe Saturday they'll make some announcements. But, but recently there's some good news. You know, Brazil chose to save the Amazon. That, that, that uh, government, you know, and we also said the problem with, like somebody mentioned today, the problem with uh, democracies is maybe they'll turn that around, you know, next election. Um, Australia, which I used to um, go to a whole lot, 20 years ago was the greenest place in the world, but now it took them 20 years to get back to uh, um, a green friendly, and they're trying to be um, government, and they're trying to be net zero. Um, the U.S., believe it or not, we've uh, the last year, all the electricity capacity that we added, 81% was um, uh, renewable. So that's, that's, that's encouraging. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, not only do we have to uh, make our civilizations uh, resilient 
and put all this information to work. We need to put our passions to work. So we need to put our energy and more of our human spirit into this stuff. Yes, we need to continue to decrease carbon, but we also have to start adapting immediately. Um, so as risk managers, I think we should all sort of apply that passion, right? We should go back, put on your suit, maybe even a cape if you need to, whatever helps, or a cape over your suit. And uh, we, need, we need to get to work, you know, this is a charge ahead and start um, 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 solving this problem. And uh, as a, former, a fellow jazz musician, Joan Baez uh, from Brazil, you know, uh, said a nice short quote, you know, action is the antidote to despair. So uh, I don't think we should sit around despair. I think we should all get to work. So thank you very much. So is it lunch, or should we do questions? It is. <laughs> I okay. think it's lunch. Okay, good. Uh, but thank you so much indeed for such an inspiring um, presentation. Um, we are going to break for lunch now, at, which is down in the Maxwell Library. Could I ask you to be back here in an hour at quarter past two, please? Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Mm -hmm.